I was, uh, for many years, radio commentator in America. During that time, of course, I had occasion to speak on a great variety of subjects. Of all those subjects, one of the most interesting stories, one that sticks most vividly in my memory, had to do with a Negro soldier. Here he is. The boy had seen service in the South Pacific. He was on his way home. Home was in one of the southern states. He was on a bus on the way he fell ill. And he asked the bus driver to let him off. The bus driver refused abusively. There was a, an argument, at the end of which a policeman was called in who dragged the boy out of the bus, took him behind a building, and beat him viciously. Then when he was unconscious, poured gin over him, put him in jail, charged him with drunkenness and assault. When the boy regained consciousness, he discovered that he was blind. The policeman had literally beaten out his eyes. Now, of course, that sort of policeman is the exception. That sort of policeman is a criminal in uniform. I had the satisfaction of being instrumental in bringing that particular policeman to justice. The case was brought to my attention, and I brought it to the attention of the radio public, and we did finally manage to locate this man and to bring him into a court of law. But there is another sort of police abuse that I think we all suffer, more or less, and we suffer at the hands of good policemen, decent policemen, policemen doing their, their duty. These are all the little petty annoyances. Don't seem very important, but add up to an invasion of our privacy and an assault against our dignity as human beings. I'm brought in mind for all this because just now I've had my passport renewed. That made me think of all the forms and police questionnaires we have to fill out. One of the unpleasant things about your passport, getting a new one, of course, is that you have to have a new picture which you invariably look older, and sometimes a little worse than older. <laughs> That's the idea. I wonder why it is that so many of us tend to look like criminals in a police lineup when we have our picture taken for a passport. I suppose it's the unconscious foreknowledge of the scrutiny to which our likeness will be subjected that gives us that hangdog, guilty look. And really, Theoretically, of course, a passport is supposed to be issued for our protection. But on how many frontiers and how many countries I've handed over my passport with all the emotions of a, an apprentice forger trying to fob off a five-pound note on the Bank of England. It's guilty conscience, I suppose. But, well, it's, there's something about being ticketed and numbered that gives the man the feeling of being a piece of baggage or a convict. I can't help thinking wistfully of our father's day when the world hadn't grown so small that one could move about in it without being watched so closely. Nowadays, of course, we're treated like demented or delinquent children. And the eyes are always on us. Our father's day, of course, there weren't any passports. The only countries that required an entry visa were Montenegro and Russia. Well, here I am in the hands of the police. This is an illustration of a story. It happened to me in a country that I think had better be nameless. There's enough trouble in the world as it is. First of all, I'd better explain that I carry, or at least carried, what Mr. Roosevelt once described when I showed it to him as the cheapest diplomatic passport in the world. In an American passport, I don't know whether it's true in an English one or not, but in an American one on the front page, there's a place that says, in case of death or accident, please notify, and then you usually put the name of some near and dear one. In my case, I put, uh, in case of death or accident, please notify Franklin D. Roosevelt, Washington, D.C. But at the time of this story, when I was stopped by the police, uh, Mr. Roosevelt had died, Mr. Truman was president, and an election was coming up in which Truman was running against Dewey. Now. I made the mistake that a great many of my fellow countrymen did. I imagined that Mr. Dewey was going to win. 
and because I wasn't very fond of Mr. Dewey, I had written in my passport, in case of accident, please notify Thomas Dewey, White House, Washington, D.C. My thought being that the least I could do to devil Mr. Dewey would be to arrive in a coffin some morning. And uh, it was therefore that passport which I handed to the police at 11 o'clock one wintry night in the mountains when they jumped out on the road in this country, which as I say, had to be nameless, and with drawn guns, uh, demanded what it was that I had in my baggage. Now, there wasn't any frontier. There couldn't be any question of customs. So I asked them cheerfully and by way of conversation whether this was a, a raid on dope smugglers or black marketeers or whatever. And they didn't feel like joking. They said, it is not for you to converse with the police. Open your bag. And I said, well, I'm afraid to because the bag will blow up. And they asked me what I meant by that, and I explained that I had an atom bomb, a small one, in the bag, so wired to the catch that if you opened the bag, there would be a dreadful explosion. Why? I said that I was going to La Scala. I didn't like the opera, and I was angry at the management. I was going to make an outrage, and that was what I had in my bag. I said, you mustn't joke with the police. Argument went on some time. Very unpleasant. It got to be about two in the morning one of those long, drawn-out practical jokes that you regret. And uh, finally, they got around to looking at my passport. I was, of course, grateful, most grateful that they did, because when they saw the name Thomas Dewey, they said, oh, excuse us, Mr. Dewey, please continue. And I don't know quite what that story illustrates, except that it shows that the passport does have its purpose. I don't want you to think from the story that I'm an anarchist. I'm against the police on principle, or that I believe in fighting them by practical jokes, much less by lawlessness, just the contrary. Now, I know I was wrong to make all that trouble for those police in the mountains of that uh, nameless country. But you, you see, I do a lot of traveling. I've been traveling all my life, as a matter of fact. I was born in America, but raised partly in China and sent about the world a good bit before the war and a great deal during it and even more afterwards. I have an office in one country and a studio in another. The last film, for example, was made in four countries. So I have a good deal of experience in crossing borders and coping with, with the coppers all over the world. And it is true, you know, that we're invited in the travel posters to be tourists. And once we attempt it, we do discover, I'm afraid, that uh, we're guilty until proven innocent. That being so, I think a word or two about red tapeism and bureaucracy, particularly as it applies to freedom of movement, might be in order. I'm sure that's true of all of us. Think of all those forms we have to fill out, for example. You know what I mean by police forms. We get them in hotels and then frontiers in every country all over the world. We're asked, state your, your sex, male or female, for example. Well, obviously, I'm a male. I'm a man. Why should I have to answer that? State your race and religion in block letters. Well, now, why should I have to confide my religion to the police? Frankly, I don't think anybody's race is anybody's business. I'm willing to admit that a policeman has a difficult job, a very hard job. But it's the essence of our society that the policeman's job should be hard. He's there to protect, protect uh, the free citizen, not to chase criminals. That's an incidental part of his job. A free citizen is always more of a nuisance to the policeman than the criminal. He knows what to do about the criminal. I know it's very nice to look out of our window in our comfortable home and see the policemen there protecting our home. We should be grateful for the policemen, but I think we should be grateful, too, for the laws which protect us against the policemen. There are those laws, you know, and they're quite different than, than the police regulations. But the regulations do pile up. Forms keep coming in. We keep being asked to state our grandmother's father's name in block letters and to say whether we propose to overthrow the government in triplicate, why, and all that sort of thing. But you see, the bureaucrat, 
And I'm including the bureaucrat with the police as part of one great big monstrous thing. The bureaucrat is really like a blackmailer. You can never pay him off. The more you give him, the more he'll demand. If you fill in one form, he'll give you ten. Now, what are we going to do about it? Obviously, if we go on giving in to this thing, will you say, just a minute, you say, for example, why shouldn't we give in to it? Why should we make trouble for the policeman? Well, the truth is, why, why should the policeman make trouble for us? Why should he ask his, these things that are stated quite clearly in our passport? Our passport tells us everything that the policeman does need to know. Why should we make trouble? Well, we don't because we don't want to get into trouble with the police. We're told that we should cooperate with the authorities. Now, I'm not an anarchist. I don't want to overthrow the rule of law. The contrary, I want to bring the policeman to law. Obviously, individual effort won't do any good. There's nothing an individual can do about protecting the individual in society. I'd like it very much if somebody would make a great big international organization for the protection of the individual. That way there could be officers at every frontier. And whenever we are presented with something unpleasant that we want to fill, one of these idiotic questionnaires, we could say, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's against the rules of our organization to fill out that questionnaire. No. And they say, oh, but it's the regulations. We say, very well, see our lawyer, because if there were enough of us, our dues would pay for the best lawyers in all the countries of the world. And we could bring to court these invasions against our privacy and test them under law. Would be nice to have that sort of organization. Be nice to have that sort of card. I see the card as fitting into the passport, a little larger than the passport, with a border around it in bright colors, so that it will catch the eye of the police. And they know who they're dealing with. Something like this. The card itself should look rather like a union card, I should think, or a card of an automobile club. And since its purpose is to impress and control officialdom, well, obviously, it should be as official-looking as possible, with a lot of seals and things like that on it. And it might read something as follows. This is to certify that the bearer is a member of the human race. All relevant information is to be found in his passport. And except when there is good reason for suspecting him of some crime, he will refuse to submit to police interrogation on the grounds that any such interrogation is an intolerable nuisance. And life being as short as it is, a waste of time. Any infringement on his privacy or interference with his liberty, any assault, however petty, against his dignity as a human being, will be rigorously prosecuted by the undersigned ISPIAO. And that would be the International Association for the Protection of the Individual Against Officialdom. If any such outfit is ever organized, you can put me down as a charter member.